So what does freedom look like? What kinds of images might remind us of freedom? I know where you were last night at 9 o'clock. You weren't in bed. You were out enjoying fireworks. In America, that's a very common symbol of freedom for us. Perhaps last night, as you were enjoying the fireworks, you thought a little bit farther back in the history of our country. Perhaps even some things that might have been part of your own family's experience. Perhaps your family saw this as they came to America up to 100, 150 years ago. Do you remember the inscription that's on this statue? What is it? Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. Or perhaps you thought back a little farther to President Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation in the middle of our nation's civil war, the proclamation that ended slavery in our country. Perhaps you thought back a little farther to the Liberty Bell from the mid-1700s. In the Liberty Bell, there's an inscription. It comes from Leviticus chapter 25, verse 10. Proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. Perhaps you thought back a little farther in history. Perhaps you went back 2,000 years, and you thought about the freedom that's represented by, enabled by, the empty tomb. Ultimate freedom from sin, ultimate restoration of freedom in our universe someday. Perhaps you went back even further in time in your thinking to the Exodus, to when Moses went before Pharaoh with the words of God saying, let my people go. Or perhaps you went one further step back to the garden when there was a degree of freedom that we can't really comprehend today. Genesis says the man and his wife were naked and they felt no shame. Perhaps the last point in time in our Earth's history to date when freedom existed in a way that uh, will not be repeated until the new Earth. But let's roll forward in time, at least into my lifetime. When I was a small child, a preacher gave a very important speech in our nation's history. In the District of Columbia in 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. gave a speech. And the closing lines of that speech, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Moving forward in my life very briefly, there was another time where freedom shouted out in a very powerful way. That's my firstborn on the day she discovered she could crawl. Okay, new kind of freedom. Much later, she encountered a different kind of freedom. The day she could drive away without mom and dad very close by. And drive away, indeed, she did to college, far away. And then she went further away to yet another college, free to do that. Real freedom happened a second time in her life a month ago when she graduated. At least she thinks she's free, but real freedom won't happen until the student loans have been addressed. Pete understands this deeply. Same school, same graduation, same issues. For us today, all of us, there's another kind of a freedom that I implore you to take advantage of, if not for the entire day, if not for the morning, maybe for the next 30 minutes. Unplug, disconnect, be free as we look at some aspects of freedom together. Oh, oops, missed a slide. I'm not good at this. Oh, no. Can we go to the end?
Okay, thank you. So today we're going to take a little journey. We're going to take a little journey along a road to freedom. We're going to look at some stops along the way. And in particular, we're going to look at three stops. We're going to look at the stop where we learn about loving people and the freedom that, that, that we are enabled to do and that that gives us. We'll also look at being positive. And finally, we'll look at stressing less. So what is your road to freedom today? Surely it begins with the words of Jesus as recorded in John 8, and as we're shown in the video this morning. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So today we'll be looking at more closely at some practical aspects of freedom highlighted in Paul's letter to the Philippians. Thank you to the Wizard family for reading a fair chunk of Philippians for us this morning. You'll recall from Acts chapter 16 that Paul visited Philippi on his second missionary journey and established the very first Christian church in Europe at that time. You might also recall that Paul and Silas were very quickly jailed on false charges, and then they refused to flee when an earthquake broke open the jail doors. Instead, they wound up baptizing the jailer and his family, and those folks became the heart of the church in Philippi. We're not quite sure what stint, what jail stint Paul was enduring when he wrote the letter to the church at Philippi later, possibly in Rome, possibly in Caesarea, but clearly he wasn't physically free when he penned the passages that we'll focus on in the next few minutes, and from which we'll draw some lessons about freedom. But Paul wasn't having a personal pity party about his own lack of freedom, was he? Instead, he was concerned about the folks in Philippi and the hard times they were having, persecution from the outside, dissent and disunity on the inside. But Paul generally adopts a very upbeat and positive tone in his counsel in this book, in this letter, advising them to rejoice no matter what the circumstances. Some 16 times in these four short pages, he uses the words joy or rejoice. And what he told the Philippians in the very first century applies to us in the 21st. We have been given the freedom to enjoy life, freedom and joy that only Jesus Christ can offer us. So let's turn to Philippians 1 and get started. Paul begins by showing us how we are free to love people even those who may be unlovable. In Philippians 1, verse 3, Paul provides the very first step to freely loving others. He says, I thank my God every time I... I what? I remember you. The way to remember others rightly is to be grateful for the good in them. Paul is saying, look, when I focus on you, I remember the positive experiences and I'm grateful for the good in your life. So what do you think about when you remember any certain person, whether it's your spouse, a friend, a co-worker, fellow church member? What comes to mind when you think of them? Is it the rough spots in your marriage or the honeymoon times, the great times with that friend or times of conflict, the good experiences with that church member or the times you were disappointed and possibly hurt? Paul tells us, be grateful for the good in people. Many of us have been hurt by someone close to us, but holding on to the hurt is simply focusing on the negative. Instead, be grateful for the good in people. Pleasant thoughts about others is a choice. You can choose what to recall. So remember the best and forget the rest. Isn't that what Jesus does for us? Step two in freely loving others is in verse four, to practice positive pray. What does Paul say? In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Wouldn't it be great to have Paul praying for you every day? How would your life change if you knew that everyone in this sanctuary was praying for you every day? Everyone here praying for you. You know, the quickest way to change a relationship from bad to good is to start thanking God for those persons in prayer. 
This will change both your attitude about that person and it will change that person. Now, most of us are pretty good with 911 style prayers. Help me, save me, rescue me, heal me. But Paul is saying more as he indicates in verses 9, 10, and 11 of chapter 1. He says that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and you may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ and that you will be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So did you notice what Paul prayed for, those four different things? More importantly, did you notice what he didn't pray for? Paul didn't pray for a single physical thing on behalf of his brethren in Philippi. And he doesn't do it anywhere else in his writings either. Think about that for a second. Paul doesn't pray for physical things. Sure, we should pray about physical things. And Paul does say more about that in chapter 4. But shouldn't that be a footnote to praying for and about spiritual things? So to love the people in your life, remember people rightly, practice positive praying, and let's deal with people patiently. In verse 6, Paul writes, I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ returns. Paul is saying here, if you want to feel the freedom that comes from enjoying the people in your life, you must be patient with other people's progress. What God starts, God will finish. What he began in your life and salvation, he will complete. He'll do that in spite of all the mistakes I make, all the bad decisions I make, my sins, my handicaps, my faults, whatever tough circumstances I have. God is going to finish what he started in me, and he will finish it in you too. Perhaps we all ought to wear a sign around our necks saying, under construction. Do you know the phrase PBPGIFWMY? It starts out, please be patient. God isn't finished with me yet. And when we look at others, spouse, coworker, church member, we need to see these phrases and pay attention to them. Who did Paul say God would, would work on you and others? Not me or you working on you or me, but God doing the work. What God starts, God will finish. So a key practical step to dealing patiently in people is found in verse 7. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. You know, if people aren't in your heart, they're very likely to be on your nerves instead. The way to have you in my heart is to see them as Jesus sees them. Remember 1 Samuel 16, 7, when Samuel is trying to find the next king of Israel? He's going from brother to brother in this family. And what did the Lord have to tell Samuel? Jehovah God said, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The second stop on our road to freedom is to be positive. And the biggest threat to being positive is complaining. In short, we need to stop complaining. When your remote control doesn't work, are you grateful that you have a television? When you have weeds in your lawn, are you thankful that you own property? When you don't have enough room for all your stuff, are you happy about the roof over your head that keeps you dry when it rains, which unfortunately it doesn't now? Had we been at the feeding of the 5,000, would we have complained about the lack of butter for the bread? or the absence of lemon juice for the fish? Would we? Maybe so. But Paul makes it very, very clear where God stands on complainers. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 reads, Do all things without complaining and arguing. God knows that a critical spirit is a killjoy. 
It erodes our peace. It insults the goodness of God, and it harms our influence for Christ. So let's take a moment to classify complainers briefly. Not legitimate complaints about a problem we can help correct, but about circumstances we don't like. Here are four attitudes that can bring on a critical spirit, a complaining spirit. First is the whiner, the person who rises and whines in the morning and lives by the motto, it's not fair. This is the person who never gets what he deserves and never deserves what he gets. Do you remember the parable in Matthew 20 of the vineyard owner who hires workers at various times of the day and then paid them all exactly the same wage? much to the anger of those who had worked all day rather than just the final hour. The owner's response, are you envious because I'm generous? Give me a break, guys. Simply put, life isn't fair. It will be in the new earth, but it's not fair here. But what's worse about this is that when we complain about life not being fair, what we're really saying is, God you're not fair. Would you really be comfortable standing at the throne saying, God, you're really not doing your job right if you don't mind my saying so, because it's just not fair. I kind of doubt it. So lesson number one from about complaining. Complaining at heart is an expression of spiritual immaturity. Like a baby that whines at every discomfort, a complainer is one who has not learned to put their total trust and dependence on God. Second attitude that can bring on a critical spirit is the martyr one. No one appreciates me. The martyr is a professional pity partier. You don't dare ask one of these folks how it's going because he just might tell you and tell you and continue to tell you. The lesson here is that complainers forget about past provisions from God. Have we ever complained about our aches and pains, somehow forgetting all the decades that God has sustained us and the new body that we're promised in heaven? Have we ever complained about bills and inadequate incomes but neglected to thank God for the blessings from all the things that we purchased? Oh yeah, and there's that palace coming someday in the new earth. Third attitude of a complainer is frequently, nothing will ever change. You know, the Israelites suffered from this one during the Exodus. They complained endlessly about the food. Where did that food come from? That was the manna from heaven, but they complained. And specifically, they complained about the lack of veggies and spices. And in Numbers 11, verse 6, they essentially say, nothing ever changes. We'd rather go back to Egypt. What? Nothing ever changes? So quickly they forgot that they were no longer slaves. They were free. Where was the free at last, free at last? Thank God Almighty we're free at last, coming from the hearts and songs of the Israelites. So lesson three here is that complaining demonstrates a lack of faith. When we complain, we're grumbling against God, We've forgotten God's goodness, never quite being satisfied with what God has done and continues to do. The fourth attitude of a complainer we sometimes see is that of a perfectionist. Is that the best you can do? Really? It's so easy to fall into the trap of thinking, I'm the only one who can do this Sabbath school well, or complaining that it should have been done better. Maybe that's why Proverbs 27.15 in one translation says, A nagging spouse is like the drip, drip, drip of a leaky faucet. You can't turn it off and you can't get away from it. Apologies, dear. So lesson number four, complaining usurps God's authority. It's God's job to change our spouses, our friends, our children, our co-workers. It's not our job. So how do we go about conquering complaining? Do everything without complaining is really easy to say, but maybe not so easy to do. Here are four biblical ways to conquer complaining. Number one, admit it's a problem. Ask yourself, is my complaining a, a little tiny problem that really does no harm? If I think that, I really ought to look at it from God's point of view. 
God abhors a critical spirit and a complaining tongue. Quote, unquote, from Corinthians. Paul recalls the Exodus and equates complainers with adulterers and idolaters. And then he notes that they were slain by destroying angels. Complaining is deeply offensive to our God, at least chronically complaining is. Step two, accept responsibility for my own life. Proverbs 19.3 notes, a man's folly ruins his life, yet his heart rages against the Lord. I really don't get to complain how the ball bounces if I'm the one who dropped it in the first place. Step three to conquer complaining, develop an attitude of gratitude. 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul wrote, give thanks in some circumstances. Oops, no, that's not right. Give thanks in good circumstances. No, I still don't have it right, do I? Paul wrote, give thanks in all circumstances, in everything. Note that when Paul wrote to Philemon, I have learned to be content whatever my circumstances, he was in jail again. How did he do that? How can Paul say things like that? By keeping an attitude of gratitude. He went on a sentence later to write, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Complaining is a symptom of ingratitude. So instead, try number four, practice speaking positively. You know, complaining is a habit. Habits are most easily broken by substituting something else. Try replacing your complaining with something else, not just attitude, but action. In Ephesians 4, Paul wrote, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Maybe mom was right when she said, If you can't say something good, don't say anything at all. Replace your criticisms and complaints with compliments and thanks. So if you do these things, you can conquer complaining and be content. Admit the problem, accept personal responsibility, develop an attitude of gratitude, and replace the complaints with compliments. So when we stop complaining, what happens? Some really cool things. The first one is that we will be known for our integrity. In verses 14 and 15, Paul writes, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Shouldn't we as Christians be the highest example of integrity in our world? And when and if we are, what then happens? The most important thing is that we then attract others to Jesus Christ. In the second part of verse 15, Paul notes, you will shine as lights in the world. Some translations say stars in the universe. Have you ever seen the Milky Way on a moonless night from a mountaintop? So many stars that the constellations you know are out there somewhere you just can't find because they're lost in the clutter of millions of visible stars. So bright that you can almost read as though it was moonlight. Stars in the universe testifying to Jesus Christ. Paul is telling us that when we stop complaining, when we replace negative speech with positive speech that lifts up others, we as Christians will shine as stars in the universe. Imagine if Santa Clarita knew this Adventist church as being the place where all the positive people, all the uplifting people, come to worship. Today's third and final stop on the road to freedom is to stress less. We live in a pressure cooker world and we're not handling it very well. Stress is a top medical condition in the US. The vast majority of all visits to primary care physicians are for stress-related problems. Up to 80% of sick days are from stress. Continual stress hampers freedom. In the final chapter of Paul's message to the Philippians, we find five keys to stressing less. In verses four and five, he says, 
rejoice continually. Is this even possible? Very much so. Rejoice here is talking about inner peace, the deep sacred delight that comes from knowing that whatever the outward circumstances are, inwardly you have the joy of Jesus. It's like the difference between an ocean's frenzied surface and the calm just a few feet below. Second, we need to understand where our joy is placed. He doesn't say rejoice continually, does he? He says rejoice in the Lord continually. Paul rejoices in the Lord continually despite his current situation in jail. Third, when Paul says always, he really means always. So what's his secret? He remembers Jesus and his great promises. When a doctor says you have a terminal illness, that shouldn't steal your joy and your peace because you are promised a new body someday. What about when someone lets you down? That shouldn't steal your joy because you depend on Jesus for approval and acceptance because he has never disappointed you. What about death? Jesus defeated death. What about sin? Jesus forgives. You can rejoice continually. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. The second key to stressing less is to trust completely. This is in the first part of verse 6. Paul challenges us here. Don't fret over the big stuff. No, don't do that. Don't sweat the small stuff. No, don't do that. Don't be anxious about most things. No. Paul is saying that we shouldn't worry about things beyond our control. Just a few years ago, a researcher did a study of the things we worry about. He discovered 40% of the things we worry about never go on to happen. 30% of our worries are over things that have already happened. 12% are needless worries about our health. 10% are really fairly insignificant or petty. 8% are probably legitimate issues to worry about. So 92% of our worry is over things that won't happen or things we can't change. (laughs) To trust completely, we need to live one day at a time looking forward. Third suggestion that Paul makes here, pray ceaselessly. We suggested earlier that breaking a habit requires replacing something negative with something positive. When God says, worry over nothing, he replaces that with pray about everything. Not pray about the big things like jobs and health, but the little things and everything in between. Moments ago, I used this catchphrase, attitude of gratitude. Here, Paul is telling us to develop an attitude of prayer, and not just for the problems in our life, but the joys as well. So he goes on to say, give thanks constantly. Give thanks continually. Even if it's hard to give thanks for the challenges in life, surely we can give thanks for the obvious blessings. So let's start there. Give thanks constantly for the blessings we know, and as Paul did, we'll work our way up to constant thanks for the difficult things in life too. His final observation in verses 8 and 9 of chapter 4 is to think correctly. Paul has already instructed the Philippians to rejoice continually, to trust completely, to pray ceaselessly, to give thanks constantly. And now he says, think correctly. I have three practical suggestions. First, fill your time with wholesome things, especially Scripture. Try browsing Bible.com instead of Facebook or whatever your internet time sink happens to be. Second, fill your life with spiritually faithful people, not only on Sabbath, but on the other 85% of your week. Proverbs 27 talks about this very pointedly. Third, live live what you take in from Scripture and see modeled in those you associate with. Take it in watch it happen, and act it out. So this morning we've looked at three stops on the road to freedom. 
loving people, being positive, and stressing less. And as Paul did with the church members in Philippi, I challenge each of us to love each other, be positive, and to stress less.